Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Wow. Great. Hey, just want to encourage you all to smile. It's good for you. It's good for you. It's actually commanded numerous times that we'd be happy, joyful, content in the Lord. And so we're going to explore that, actually, over the next couple of weeks. Today is our last uh, gathering in Nehemiah, and then we hop into this uh, idea of like, what does it mean to be happy? Is there an art to being happy? Um, like, do we serve a happy God? And does that does does He want that for us? Does holiness and happiness can they coexist, or are they like bitter enemies? Now we're going to explore that, so we're really excited to uh, to be able to do that, and um, we're, we're we're thinking this would be maybe an awesome opportunity for you to invite somebody who's who's maybe new to the church scene, but if they kind of get a glimpse of the fact that like church is talking about happiness, like that's something I want. Um, we just think that as Christians, like it's part of our birthright, belonging to belonging to a happy God who gives us great joy and fills us with good things. So we're going to explore that over four weeks. Love to have you guys along with us. Today is our last look at Nehemiah. We've been walking through Nehemiah um, somewhat thematically, uh, but also, um, you know, in, in chapters. And, and we've seen how um, the strategic framework that the Avenue Church has developed is actually coming to life through Nehemiah. Some of the things that we've been looking at in this journey are, are the very things that we feel like the Lord has put on our heart to pursue this year. Things like disciples and, and making disciples. Um, things like collaboration. Uh, uh, things like um, you know, family. And, and, and the, the list goes on. And so we've, we've been walking through and saying, okay, hey, in Nehemiah, we can see where, where uh, there was this journey from distant too close to what God is doing. That's the, like, the journey of discipleship. And then, and then we saw how uh, that there was some collaboration going on to actually get the wall up and going. We'll talk about what that means in, in just a second. And then, and then leadership, man. Leadership was a huge part, especially early in Nehemiah. Like his leadership brought people together and um, kind of broke down walls so that they would actually uh, start working. And then, and then last week, we took a look at family. This idea of, of family and uh, what, what was the journey from family? It was going from familiar, being familiar with one another. Like, hey, I know your name. I can shake your hand without looking at a name tag. Or I can, like, instead of calling you, like, bud or, like, hey, what's up, bro? I can actually say your name. So that's familiar. That's a good first step. But then we went and talked about, well, how do we get to family? How does family become a reality? And so that was last week where we talked about, man, like, there's something about a covenant there's something about when you make commitments to your God and like vertically, and then um, you make commitments horizontally, there's something that makes that special. Like family starts to arise. And, and so, you know, the whole title of this series has been uh, Revived. It's from Nehemiah 4 to uh, bringing beautiful things to life. Uh, because in, in Nehemiah 4 2, there were some naysayers uh, that didn't think Nehemiah and his crew could do the job. See, Nehemiah was over, he was way over here, right? He had been taken captive. He, he and the Israelites, God's people, had been taken, um, uh, they, they had been uh, captured by some Babylonians. And like, he was, he was way over here, right? Not in, not in what you might call God's city. Now, it all belongs to God. But, but there were times in the Old Testament when God's people would be captured and taken away, mostly because of their disobedience. And so they had been disobedient. They're over here. They're experiencing the consequences of disobedience. And God says, okay, but, but it's not over, man. It's not over. The story's not over. Although you're here, I'm going to do something new with you, and I'm going to bring you back. And so Nehemiah hears word that the city where, where God was going to be doing the significant amount of his work, um, well, it was in shambles. It was broken down. And Jerusalem was, was, they said it was a shameful place because the walls were down. They were like in crumbles. And if you didn't have walls back in the day, it meant that you couldn't protect yourself, and anyone could just kind of come in and do what they wanted to you. So you could talk about a God that was awesome and magnificent, but then you could be like put in your place real quick. 
So Nehemiah, he's heartbroken over that. And so he comes back, and about 2% of the people come back. Now, this guy named Ezra was already there. He was kind of working on the spiritual foundation. He was working on the temple and things like that. But again, it was unprotected. He sees the walls, Nehemiah, and he begins this project of building back the walls and the gates so that Israel could reclaim its proper name among the nations, so that Israel could actually shine and, and attract other people to what the God of Israel um, was doing. And, and so all of these things were important on that journey. And we, we looked at Nehemiah as a journey. And we said, um, especially as we, as we got into it, that it's actually not walls that bring out beautiful things. Uh, it's family. It's family. That's, that's God's instrument for bringing out beautiful things. I just want to read this in sentence form because I think it speaks to um, the definition of, of what it means uh, to, to bring about something beautiful. This would be a beautiful defined. God's family coming together to revive his city. Okay, hold that thought. God's family coming together. Okay, so you have to understand that, that it's not just one expression of God's family. It wasn't just one tribe. And so as, as you're starting to translate and think about today, it wouldn't be just one particular local church. Okay, it would be God's family, all the expressions of that coming together to revive his city. How would he do it? Three ways. Three ways. He would do it physically, he would do it socially, and he would do it spiritually. That's what beautiful looks like. When God gets a hold of something physically, socially, and spiritually. Sometimes we think about just one of those components. Um, but if, if we're familiar kind of with just how life works, general principles, and it's good to be familiar with general principles, it's called common grace. And what that means is when you look at the world, you can learn about God without, even without like Bible verses over what you're looking at. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you can just look at how uh, the, these are the principles of a healthy family. And, and whether, whether believers or not, you can say, oh, I, can, I understand something about God just by understanding how a healthy family works or, or how a healthy business works or whatever. It's called common grace. And so just in the midst of common grace, we can see that most of the time when you're going to do a rebuilding project, it's going to take more than one element, correct? Good for you. I heard a yes over there. That's awesome. Is that Dave? Thanks, Dave. See, I know Dave. Dave and I are family. We're not just familiar. Thanks, Dave. Grateful for you, I have in my hands the top 10 sports rebuilds. I don't know if it's all time, but it's titled 10 Recent Sports Teams Rebuilds That Went Right. I was looking at this list, and I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, to rebuild a sports franchise, you would need more than just a good coach, right? Like, you could bring uh, fill in the blank, you could bring Phil Jackson in, and if Phil Jackson had, like, um, you know, a, a basketball team that didn't have the greatest year this year, who would that be? Just name, throw it out. Atlanta Hawks. Okay, the Hawks. If, if Phil Jackson is in Atlanta working with that crew, no matter how awesome Phil Jackson is, he can't make it rain to that degree. You know, he needs some players, so you need, you need a coach. You need some players. Now again, if you get awesome players, you can go, you can go pretty far. But if you have a dysfunctional coach, that's, that's probably gonna be a, a leg from the stool missing. So if you've got a great coach and great players, a lot of times that can be enough to, to go to really far. But if you have like no fan base, if you have no support, if where you play is actually life taking rather than life giving, man, it's gonna be hard to rebuild that program. And so as, as I mentioned some of these teams, think about it, and that there, there were probably three aspects working in the midst of these rebuilds, just like was true in Jerusalem. Um, so, and I think, I think now I don't know if I've hit everyone in my recent list, but I think today I might, I might hit everyone. Any Oakland Raider fans in here? Okay, not a good start, no problem. All right, um, have you heard of this team? I think they're going to do okay this year, the Golden State Warriors. Golden State Warriors, okay. So that's a recent rebuild. They're doing pretty good. They're even getting pretty good calls. Reversed for them if you're kind of staying up with the, with the series. But, but coaching, players, environment, stadium, all makes a difference. Uh, Chicago Cubs? Dude, everybody loves the Cubs. 
Like, if you're, it's almost like what's wrong with you if, you, if you're anti-Cubs, you know? And so, all right, every, I want everybody there. How about um, Minnesota Vikings? Anybody? Okay, okay, some of you out there, some of you out there. Amazing new stadium. Speaking of that aspect of it, that new stadium, that, that environment out there, pretty, pretty cool. Uh, Kansas City Royals. Kansas City Royals, pretty big rebuild, okay. Not many Midwesterners here today, no problem. Um, how about the Boston Celtics? Yeah. They got it! No, you're not here either. Okay, no problem. Um, I know some of you are going to be here right now. New York Mets? New York Mets? New York? Okay, some, some of you, okay, all right. Recent rebuild, obviously put a, put a few good things together there. Um, how about the Florida Panthers? Now listen, there was no way I was going to miss this one because I got a little feedback from, from a dear friend of mine who was like, listen, you're throwing a lot of basketball love out there. I'm translating, he didn't use all these words. But basically, you're throwing a lot of basketball love out there. Like, you, you know, you all say, what about us hockey fans? Like, where's the hockey love? And so I want to say that to the two hockey fans in here, Rob and Gabe, I have your example right here. And it's, in the, and it's the Florida Panthers. Now I know there's more. Are there any hockey fans? Um, okay, all right, cool, cool. So the Florida Panthers are known to be an amazing hockey rebuild, um, but I also know, just because I wanted to like, let you know, you hockey fans, that I'm with you as well, I have, a, I have my playoff beard going, okay, or I should say growing, and I know that the Capitals are up two to one against Vegas, okay? New team, expansion team. There's a guy in the Capitals who's never won, but's really good. I think his name's like Ovechkin. Okay, that sounds hockey-ish, right? And they play tomorrow. I am so in tune with you. So in tune with you. And then lastly, um, are there any soccer fans in here? Soccer fans? Okay, this, I don't know if we're slimming the crowd or not, but... Um, okay, you're clapping now. That's great. Uh, Leicester City. If you know that, cool. All right, great. So, in all of those examples, you're going to find that there were probably at least three wheel wheels moving. Some good coaching moves, some good personnel player moves, and then a pretty, uh, probably a significant, um, you know, like investment in the surroundings of, of like crowd and feel and vibe and all that stuff. Like the gospel works the same way. Common grace would tell us like that's how the gospel works. As well, I can learn something about God and I can see that he's not just one dimensional. He's not gonna come in and just renew one thing God is on a renewal project of actually renewing all three of those things. When Jesus um, tells the Apostle John in, in the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is an amazing vision that John gets of what's coming. If you're new here, we're all about Jesus, okay? We're all about him and we're all about his first coming. We love it. You're going to hear more about it today. And we're all about his second coming. We're, we find ourselves in the in-between, and it's super exciting to be linked into Jesus because we actually believe in the person He's coming back. And so one of the promises that he made about him coming back is that I am renewing all things. And then when he comes back, that will be the finality of that project. But the project actually already started. And he's been renewing like fearful, selfish people like me. And fill in the two blanks of the adjectives that describe you, if you're in Christ. Like he's, he's on this renewal project. But what's really cool is in this renewal journey that Jesus is leading, he, he's going to bring renewal to this world like physically. We're not just gonna kinda like float around and have like hologram trees and um, you know, like a, a city quote unquote where we, where we just kinda like don't, we don't touch, we don't eat, we don't. No, like this earth, this world, is going, is, is going to be completely renewed, but there's going to be physical aspects to it. Like there's going to be real tangible stuff, but in the full expression that they were meant to be. It's awesome. But it doesn't stop there. It's not just like we're going to have this, this new world where we're able to eat and, and like uh, take in things and tastes and senses and things like that. That's part of it. He's also renewing us socially. He's creating like a new social order. Check this out, where the first will be what? Last, and the last shall be. He's, he's flipping the order. He's all about like, oh, if you want to be great, that's cool to want to be great, you just need to learn how to be a servant. 
And then he's also doing this weird thing where it's like, even though our last names are different, our skin color is different, and our history is different, we all get to come and be called brothers and sisters under the same father. That's a, it's a new family, a new social family. So he's doing that socially. But you know what else he's doing? He's also renewing us spiritually. You see, because you and I came into the world disconnected from God. Maybe you were able to recognize that early, or maybe not. But, but the truth of the matter, according to the scriptures, is that you and I were born with a sin nature. And what that means is that, like, in our thoughts, words, and deeds, we just naturally went against God's created order. Just hang out with, like, my three-year-old long enough, and that will be proof. Like, his natural bent is not just, yes, sir, daddy, how can I obey you throughout the day? His natural bent is, like, maybe, but I'm pretty fast, and if I can do it and get away with it, I probably will. Okay, my daughter, my two-year-old daughter, her natural bent is not to, um, is not like in accordance with my heart. We had a very serious uh, discussion the other day, face to face. Her name's Cora Joy, and Cora Joy was convinced that what was best for her for breakfast was Cheetos. <laughs> she kept coming back to that. You want oatmeal, baby? Uh, Cheetos. <laughs> what about breakfast bar? Because you know, breakfast bars are, you know, they got all everything good in it. Cheetos. How about this? Uh, so she thought she knew best and was like really committed to her way. That's how we all are born. She didn't need to learn that. She just is that. And what that means is, is when, you, when you sort of pair that up with a holy and righteous God, like that's called a sin nature. And, and a holy and righteous God, he, he can't stand for that. As we, as we grow into our sin nature, we just get better at demanding Cheetos. And the thing is, it gets our fingers all sticky, we make a mess, you can't touch anything. I mean, it, it tastes good going out, but then you're sorry like 22 minutes later. Like, that's how we live. And, and it's kind of like, oh man, it's a bummer to live that way. But you have to understand that you, you actually have a consequence for that. Our actions always have consequences. The Israelites were in captivity because of their actions. Like, let's learn from our Old Testament friends. Our, our, our sin, it separates us. It puts us in our own Babylon, away from a holy God who loves us, but couldn't compromise his own righteousness in order to just say, ah, no big deal. Like, somebody had to pay those consequences. Grace doesn't eradicate consequences. It just shifts the focus of who gets them. So, that's why we talk about Jesus so much. Because he, like, ate the whole bag, and then took the wrath for it. That's what the cross is all about. Dirtied himself completely. For you and for me, the, the things that we did, he, it's like, I did them. Punish me, Father. That's love. That's love when, when the purest of pure is like, I'll absorb all of that, and I'll absorb your anger and wrath for it, Father. Because I love you, and because I love them. And so he dies in our place, receiving the punishment that we deserve. And then on the third day, he's brought back from the dead with this new body that we're going to inherit. And, and he overcame sin and he overcame death. And that was proof not only that he was a truth teller, but it was also proof, proof that if you linked yourself up with Jesus, that you too could overcome sin and death, that you too could overcome the consequences that were now naturally coming to you because Christ loved you enough to take them. We always invite you to link yourself up with Jesus. Even if you know Jesus, man, relink yourself up. Jesus, I'm re-surrendering my life to you. I'm recommitting myself to look to you as my treasure. If you've never done that before, man, we, we invite you. You'll have an opportunity where you sit. You'll have an opportunity at the end of the service. Man, we invite you just to come and like quit on yourself and start with Jesus. Like, I can't do the Lord, and I know what he's talking about. It's resonating with my heart. I feel the separation. I feel the cul-de-sac that I live in called self. Jesus, man, I'm surrendering. I believe that you did that for me. And, like, I'm surrendering my life for yours. I'm done with me. Would you begin in me? That's what it means to come to him by faith and link yourself up with Christ. You see, so when that happens, then you too are brought into this Renewal project, physically, socially, spiritually, it's happening in you, and then you're called to see it happen in those around you. 
We're going to be taking a, a journey here, and it's going to it's going to end in Nehemiah 12. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to Nehemiah 12. But I'm going to kind of set it up for you by telling you what it, what it kind of looked like in in chapters one and chapters four to be broken. We had already mentioned it in one three. We see that the walls are broken down. Um, four two talks about the brokenness as well. The gates were broken down. It was a shameful um, place. And then, and then in Nehemiah 12, we're not going to go there just yet, but, but in Nehemiah 12, we're going to read that together in just a second. We're going to see what beautiful looks like. But there was, a, there was an in-between, Nehemiah 1 and, and Nehemiah 12, and, and there's some things that are happening that are really important for us to be aware of, because here's, here's what we can learn from the Old Testament. Like, what God's doing there, He's foreshadowing what's to come in even greater measure through Jesus and his local church. Okay? So that's, that's what's happening there. So um, in Nehemiah 1 through 4, and I think if you have an outline, uh, it's on the back of your announcements. Uh, there's going to be kind of some blanks if you're a fill-in-the-blank person. Cool. If not, that's okay too, but sometimes it helps people engage. The first one is physically. Reviving physically. Well, what does it look like um, to revive something physically? Well, in Nehemiah's case, in chapters 1 through 4, there's this rebuilding of the wall, like a physical bricks and mortar type thing. Uh, reviving physically would, in, would involve protection. Because you remember, in this little journey between 1 and 4, they started to get some uh, enemy attack, and so there needed to be some protection. Uh, in order to revive things physically, there always has to be encouragement, because that work is hard. It's easier just to not than to do. And there's got to be vision. There's got to be vision. You need disciples. You need collaboration. You need leadership. Reviving socially. We see reviving socially in, in Nehemiah 5, 11, in chapter 5, um, and then again in 11. And reviving socially, this is Nehemiah stepping into the injustice of his day. He saw social injustice, and, and he said, like, that's not going to happen while I'm here. I was just kind of hanging out with the Lord this morning and some time of confession and repentance and asking the Lord to just take some inventory of my heart. And I was, the question I was asking is, Lord, not what have I done, but what are some of the areas where I have not done? Like, what are some of the things that, that should have been done that weren't? So Nehemiah saw something. He saw social injustice. And social injustice was basically the people of Israel, although they were working together, the rich were taking advantage of the poor. They were, like, charging too much interest on loans and stuff like that they shouldn't have been doing. And Nehemiah's like, no, that can't happen. I'm not just going to be apathetic to it. I'm not just going to say I don't do it. But because of what God had been doing in Nehemiah's heart, he's like, this can't happen on my watch. Let me just stop and ask you, what is it that cannot happen any longer on your watch? Doesn't have to be everything. You can't do everything. But what is that one thing that God's spirit is prompting in you that's like, hey, that can't happen on my watch. I've got a heart for it, I can see it, and I can no longer stand by a watch. It's part of the revival uh, project. Socially. In, in chapter 11, we see that there's not a lot of people living in Jerusalem, and so Nehemiah like, it makes it possible for people to come and start living, start populating Jerusalem. So he sees that like, not only are there injustices, but, but even like, within living arrangements, even in, in the way things are set up socially, he begins to discern, like, hey, this isn't the way that God would have it be. I'm going to try to do something about these social issues. Not just physically building a wall, not just socially, but then he, he also touches physically, reviving um, spiritually. I'm sorry, spiritually. So in Nehemiah 8 through 10, we see things like he calls the people to gather as one. He's like, we're going to get together. We're going to do this thing for real. He, uh, he reads and studies the scriptures with them. He understands the importance of what we're doing today. He's like, it's cool if you're reading the scriptures on your own. And he didn't say this, but this is the sentiment. It's cool if you've got a personal relationship with God going on out there, but there's something unique and special when we bring that in together. We can't neglect that. And so he begins to bring revival spiritually uh, by bringing them together. There's celebration. They like celebrate God together. And it was loud, man. There were all sorts of different instruments. It was just this amazing like party type atmosphere because they believe they served an amazing party type like God. 
Like, they got the better party. Listen, the, the phrase the better party, I'm not creative like that. I just look at the scripture and I'm saying, like, God was throwing the better party throughout all of history and inviting us into it. And when we see it here in Nehemiah, that was part of him reviving people spiritually. If you're not with other people who love Jesus and, and celebrating Jesus in like, a, in like a celebratory manner, then, man, I would think that you're missing a big part of what it means to partake in spiritual revival. <coughs> celebrating together. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. When we sing songs, let me just let you know, like, it should be loud. People out there who wandered into Atlantic should be like, what's that noise I hear? What are they so excited about? All I can see are two people on stage. And what we know that we see because our eyes are beholding is a resurrected Christ. Like we should celebrate in such a manner that would be fitting to the God of the Old and New Testament. Amen. We see that uh, Nehemiah also remembers with them. Part of reviving people spiritually is helping them to remember what God has been and done in their life. We talked about this a little bit last week with the church, right? We said, hey, remember when we were in the community center? And remember this? Remember that? Oh, yeah, that was super cool. We remember God's faithfulness. If any of you, um, you, you find yourself in the grips of something that might be crippling to you, it could be an addiction, it could be anxiousness, it could be depression, it could be your family, it could be your marriage, it's just crippling, and you don't even have a word for it, you're just like, dude, this is, this is sucking the life out of me. Here's what can happen. We are so good at forgetting. If it were a spiritual gift, I would have it but it's not, it's at a curse. Like you forgot how God delivered you. Check this out. At like 8.33 this morning, already from whatever it was that was holding you then. You forgot God's goodness to you two months ago when he showed up here and you forgot God's goodness three years ago. And so if we're gonna revive one another spiritually, and if we're gonna think about reviving people who aren't in here, Spiritually, we've got to get better at remembering. And God gives us that pattern of his goodness. And then finally, he, he, he covenants. And, and he makes this promise. There's promises and vows to God. And there's promises. You know, like that's what a covenant is. It's a promise to God, but, but then it gets played out in one another. And that was part of the reviving, that there would be some commitments. Like, we're in. This isn't just talk. We're committing ourselves. We, talk, we used language last week about marriage and things like that. Well, what's the result when, when you have somebody who is um, on this mission where God's family is doing this work together and they're bringing about physical, social, and spiritual reviving work? What does the result look like? Let's check this out. We're going to read it together because the result here is in Nehemiah 12, 43. Um, the wall gets built. They're all together. And now, if you have a Bible clue, and if not, just follow along on the screen. But I'm going to count to three, and we're going to read this together. And then we're going to talk about it for a second. Ready? One, two, three. And they, and they offered, offered great, great sacrifices, sacrifices that day, day and, and rejoiced. And rejoice. for, God for God had made, had made them, them rejoice, rejoice with, with great, great joy. joy. The, women the women and children, and children also, also rejoiced. Rejoice. And the joy, and the joy of, of Jerusalem, Jerusalem was heard far, far away. away. You better have read that at home, by the way. People are watching online. Didn't we just say that? Didn't we just say something like that? Like, you should get loud and rowdy up in here. Because, like, you get loud and rowdy at your hockey games, don't you? My hockey fans. Together. <laughs> You're going to get loud and rowdy tonight, are you not? I mean, it's game two tonight with the... Yeah, thanks. You probably got, if you're into that series, you probably got loud and rowdy if you are a LeBron fan and you saw that call reversed. And you probably got loud and rowdy when you saw J.R. Smith dribbled out. He's like, you get loud and rowdy over crazy, silly stuff. I'm not knocking you because I'm loud and rowdy with you. Here, man, this is, this is what happens when, when God comes and he does this work of reviving beautiful things. People start getting loud and rowdy. I'm not, there's no quotes. This isn't like loud and rowdy in your heart. This is 
like loud and rowdy because God is amazing. Amen. I mean, this is the kind of thing that I've done this before. I, I, I don't think this it's just not it's not a good example. I've just done it because I didn't know what else to do. But there's been times when I've like covered my mouth because I wanted to sing so loud, and I know I'm so bad. It's true. It's true. I thank you, Maria. Our worship leader's giving me permission, so thank you. But I, there's been times, oh man, I just I shout it out. Remember how Jesus says, if you don't shout it out, the stones are going to shout it out. Like I know that, and so I didn't know necessarily what to do because you know I'm still being like revived from what people think about me. So I'm, I'm on journey with you. And so, but but I, I, I can, I know there's been times when I've done it like this, and I just because man. It was a lot, it was overflowing in me. And there was an expression that if I actually let it out, which I know I should, so stay with me while I grow up. But if I actually let it out, people from far away would be like, really It's not very good, but it's, it's like kind of loud. It's kind of special. I mean, I wonder what makes a guy like that lose himself. You know, you know, King David, he was, he was um, rebuked by his wife because he lost himself publicly in worship to God. She's like, you're an embarrassment. One of my favorite things to do is, um, is lose myself in front of my kids. But not to kind of lose myself where I get angry at them and I have to go apologize. To kind of lose myself where I'm like, oh, dad, dad's worshiping Jesus again, man. I don't fully get it. It's like on his knees over there, and it looks like he might be crying. We'll just let him do his thing, we'll come back later. But like, I love to lose myself from my kids, because I want them to know I serve a God worth losing yourself for. Yes. That's what it means to come to Jesus. I lose myself to you so that I can pick you up and get crazy up in here, because I believe you're better. I believe you're actually like the greater Nehemiah. See, this is where this goes, right? This, track with me, this is where this goes. Um, the, the, the Old Testament is kind of like the picture book Bible for the New Testament. Bunch of pictures back here, sacrifices, stuff you don't ever see, like that's gross, why did they do that? Don't worry about it, it's a picture book Bible to, to point to you what Jesus would fulfill. It all points that way. Nehemiah included. So you should understand something really important. If you walk out of here with, with it, just a couple of words, let it be these words. It's not over. Can you say that with me? It's not, not over. over. One more time. It's, it's not, not over. over. What God started in Jerusalem, man, was just the beginning of the party. It's not over. Some of us think that, you know, maybe it's over, or maybe I'm not included, or maybe it's not the same thing that's happening. Listen, Jesus is the greater Nehemiah. Yes. He's about greater physical revival, greater social revival, and greater spiritual revival. So what you saw in Nehemiah 12, verses, chapters 1 through 12, man, it's not over. It didn't stop. It just got greater. It picked up momentum, and now we're included in that same work. You know, when Jesus went to the cross, when he went to the cross, what it accomplished had these three ramifications. Physically, it bought the renewal of all of creation. Socially, it created a new family where any and everyone could come. And spiritually, it connected you to that God that you were born disconnected. I mean, Jesus started this work, and then he continued this work, and he made it greater, and then invited us into it. So then the question becomes, well, like, what, is, what does that look like for us? So, so where do we go from here? If that's what Jesus is doing, and if it's really not over, if it's not over, if it's just, like, in, I don't know where in the chapter of redemption history we are. Like, I, I don't know if it's close to the end. I, don't know. I have an opinion on it, but... I just, I don't know how close, where, what chapter in redemption history we were. I just know it's not over. It's not over. And we need to live like it's not over. And so, man, sometimes we need help with that. Again, just kind of this definition of what it would look like for you to understand. God's family 
coming together to revive his city physically, socially, and spiritually. So I don't know, but you might make a journey to Jerusalem at some point in your life. And that'd be cool. But if you go to Jerusalem, you're probably you're probably gonna go on like a I've been people say you gotta go to Jerusalem, man. You gotta go to Jerusalem. Okay, that's cool. But I'm probably not gonna go there um, on like, or at least I don't think I'm being invited by these people to go there on a revival project. I think I'm being invited to go there to like walk where Jesus walked and see some things and touch some things, and that's that's cool. So here's here's the deal. God's family on this type of mission with these three with these three legs to the stool, physically, socially, and spiritually, is it's, you're probably not called like Nehemiah to the physical Jerusalem, but I can tell you where you are called if you're part of this church. You're called to God's city, namely Delray Beach. Now, you, if you don't live in Delray Beach, then that's cool. Then you're called to where you live. Boynton Beach, Lake Worth, West Palm, De Polk, that's cool. Like you have, a, you have a, a, an additional calling on your life. But if you're a part of this church, if you've covenanted with this church, that means in addition to where you live, because we're all on mission where we live, we're on mission together here. So that's why I have people coming in from Boca and Fort Lauderdale, where, wherever you might be coming in. We come in and on mission there, but you're also gathering to do stuff here in Delray. Because that's what God's doing to the Avenue Church. And you covenanted here. You're doing family here. And what's cool, sometimes you need like help to understand what it looks like to do this. Where, where's the wall broken down? I don't know where to go, I don't know what to do. Socially, I, you know, I hear about some things. Spiritually, okay, I'm coming to church, is that enough? Shall we do it? What's really cool is um, Del Rey has very similar brokenness that was experienced all throughout history, especially in scripture. And so where we end today is with some like, real practical stuff on where this gets expressed in an event called Love Del Rey. Love Del Rey. Now let me tell you from the beginning, this is more than an event. You don't do all this in one day. Does anybody remember how long it took Nehemiah to build the wall, by the way, with this crew? We said it last week. It was like 52 days. If, if you find that I'm wrong, you can shout it out there. But it, was, it, it wasn't one day, but it also wasn't 500 years. It, there was like actual doable things where you could see a tangible result in Nehemiah's lifetime and the lifetime of the people that he was with. Love Del Rey. Love Del Rey is an event. It's going to be on June 16th. And we'll talk about that more in a second. But it's an event where we're going to be able to live some of these things out physically, socially, and, and spiritually. Because sometimes you actually need an event to catalyze things in your heart and head. Does that make sense? Sometimes I can talk about drinking water and how refreshing it is, and you can study um, all sorts of Barna research on water and, and how to take a cap off and how to take a cap on. You can get groups that like talk about the water and have posters of the water. But until you actually like go to an event where they have water and you're like, wow, that was refreshing. <laughs> Listen, I don't care if you just got one sip. When, when, when you then go back in your normal world, you remember, oh, I, I know that works. I, I know that actually works. And so what will happen is sometimes the event catalyzes things like, well, how can I get that water over here like on Tuesday? Mm -hmm. What about Thursday night? Man? That would be... mm. And you start, you, you start changing the treasure of your heart to like your, from, from like your job or, or your or whatever substance it might be, your pleasure or relationship, and you're like, no, no, this is my treasure. And the more you get, the more it grows. But sometimes you need an event. And so uh, we have this event called Love Del Rey, man, that I want to talk to you about. Um, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to highlight a few things that are important to us here at the Avenue Church. Love Del Rey is going to be a time when we get to do some reviving of Del Rey physically. Physically. Uh, remember, there's three stools to it. So, so there's going to be a physical aspect. Now, sometimes events are a little bit heavier on one of the legs than another, and that's okay. It, it doesn't have to be equal all the time, every time. 
but we're trying to get you to experience some of these things. There's definitely going to be some physical reviving in Love Del Rey. So here's, here's what Love Del Rey is. It's, it's a collection of Delray Beach churches who are coming together in the morning, uh, meeting at uh, uh, Trinity. We're going to eat breakfast, we're going to pray, and then there's going to be different teams that are sent out to different places in Del Rey to work from like 9 to noon doing various tasks at their particular place. You can sign up for it right now online. Actually, one of the places is already filled out, so you have to go to some of the other places. But the places are just like places in Delray that um, are, are in need of some of these things and, and doing some really cool work. One of the places in Delray um, that is uh, uh, still has some openings uh, to be able to go, there's, I think, I think there's five total spaces where we can go and serve. Okay, and you sign up ahead of time, so you know kind of like what, to, what, what you're thinking about and what you're going to be doing, uh, is, is a place that I think models all three of these things beautifully. It's called City House Del Rey. Have you ever heard of City House Del Rey? Okay. Okay, you're not listening to me because all of you have heard of City House Del Rey, and like my dad raised his hand. Okay, so I'm going to forgive you that. Grace abounds. But City House Del Rey, actually, that's actually a place that does all three, and that's one of the places we're going to go. It, when City House Del Rey started, it was kind of this old, dilapidated place where people rented things. Now it's a beautiful, physical space. Physically. Socially, it, it gives an opportunity to, to single moms with their children who are either on the brink of homelessness or have uh, become homeless to come and, 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 and have the narrative of their story rewritten, like socially. Education, they, they become equipped now to flourish in life rather than just survive. Amen. Thank Amen. you, Alice. Thank you, Alice. Spiritually, they meet a God who's way more invested in their future than they could ever be. God who loves them and cares for them, wants to see them thrive as women in Christ, families. Physically, socially, spiritually. It actually, it's all happening at one place. That's one of the places that we're going to go um, on in, in our Love Delray thing. Uh, so, you see this thing keeps coming up and down. Does that bother anybody? I think my Bible's too heavy for it. So, it bothers me a little bit. So, I'm going to try to keep it up here. Because I had the, my first occurrence where I couldn't see something. My wife totally called me out. And I was like, babe, what does that say? So, I'm 43. I don't know if I'm going to be going, going with the glasses soon or not. But I need this a little closer to my eyes. Um, so if it keeps going down, I'm just going to keep <laughs> pulling them back up again. What are some of the things that we're going to be doing in Delray physically? Well, there's, there's City House, there's Carver Elementary. Um, Mitch, if you're here, if you could help me. There's Milagro Center, which is like an after-school tutoring program. Uh, there's Calvary Chapel, Delray, another church here in town. And then, what, is there another space? That's it. That's it. So those are the spaces. And so what you can do in those spaces are things like pressure cleaning, um, yard work, maybe some painting. If you go online, each of those spaces has its own list of what we're going to be doing. But that's going to give us an opportunity to actually begin to leave things better than we found them. Because that's, that's what the kingdom of God does. It leaves things better than it found them. We're going to have an opportunity to do that. Uh, socially, uh, okay, again, those are, those are some of those those spaces that we're going to go. So, so while we're there, I mean, if you look at the spaces we chose, we didn't sign up to go like uh, clean up uh, the Delray Beach Marriott. I mean, maybe it needs some cleaning. It might I don't know. Seagate Hotel, not bad places. But if you look at some of the places we chose, those are places that are actually speaking into the social injustices of our world where they're seeing things that are flipped upside down and they're saying, no, 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 the kingdom, the kingdom would adjust that. And so we're going to put you to work in those spaces, but we're also going to put you in the same environment in those spaces so that you, even if it's just pressure cleaning for an hour, not only would leave something better than you found, it would be an encouragement to where God has begun to, to work in a socially unjust area. And then finally, um, spiritually, um, you know, I, I know there's a Calvary Chapel on there that doesn't just mean that that's the only spiritual thing, but it's pretty cool when churches stop what they're doing to go and help another church flourish. Yes. Like, I'm thinking, what's spiritual revival look like in Delray? I don't know the fullness of it, 
but I know that one of the things that we can do in our 52 days, whatever that is, is see the church come together, capital C Church, in a way that it's never come together before, and allow that unity of mission to rewrite the narrative for the onlooking world. So I'm believing that it's gonna revive us spiritually to come, pray in the morning, and then and some of you are gonna actually go serve another church that maybe you've never or even heard of. So picture this with me. Picture this. Um, morning, all the all these churches are coming together. Mitch, are we up to what do we got? Five churches participating, four, something like that? Trinity, Redemption Church, Joy Church, Avenue Church, and, and Calvary, right? We have five Delray churches coming together, eat together, pray together. Maybe there'll be some form of worship. I don't know. Talk when you end up playing some guitar and like, you know, we get a little rowdy up in the morning. It'd be great. And then, and then, and then, and then we all we'll go out. And now I'm not just serving next to like, um, you know, Foy or Steve Bacosha or somebody that I used to serve next to. Now I'm, I'm serving next to somebody from Calvary Chapel or, or, or from Joy Church and, and, and we're working hard, man, we start off shoulder to shoulder, but then I get to hear his or her story and vice versa, and, and we're, seeing, we're seeing renewal come in front of us, and we're, we're in a, an environment of renewal, and then, and then by the time the day ends, you know how it rolls here at the Adventist Church, we're hugging it out, you know that's going to happen at some point, we're hugging it out, man, it's so great, it's good to hear. Picture the church coming together to actually be and do the work of Nehemiah in a way that maybe Del Rey has never seen before. I'm not saying, I'm not saying it's going to be the biggest event ever. I'm just saying that in our 52 days, we're going to be a part of that, and we're going to see that again and again and again, and I believe God's going to do something incredibly special, not only with you, but for this city through it. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we're going to, we're going to close here, and we're going to we're going to come to a table that makes this possible. We're going to come to a table that um, says, I've done this for you, now go do this for others. This is the communion table. And in it, we remember that Jesus' body was broken and his blood was shed for, for many. And when you partake of communion, we believe something significant happens. Like there's like a, a spiritual nourishment that happens. Like God, through the tangible, remember, there's physical stuff going on in, in our spiritual world, right? They, they, go, they go together. We believe that God's going to nourish us spiritually. I mean, it's crackers and juice. That's what it is. But as we partake of it, and we're remembering the death and resurrection of Christ for us, and we're thinking of what's to come when he comes back, he does something to your soul. Like spiritually nourishes you. Now, now, the invitation to the table is, is for any believer. If you're not a believer, man, like, it, that probably doesn't make sense to you. So we just encourage you to listen to the song we're going to play. Think about some of the things we've heard. Or do, just surrender your life to Christ and then come. You could do that. You could, I'd say, invite you to do that. Say, Jesus, I quit. You start. Everything you said, yes, let's do this. And then we would invite you to come because it would make sense that way. But the tables are open to so like any and every believer. I don't, tradition, background, doesn't matter. Do you love Jesus? Do you need Jesus? Are you pursuing Jesus? Now, if you find yourself in a space where your heart's grown hard to some things that Jesus has been calling you to do, areas that have kind of grown bitter and cold, then maybe what you should do is mark this occasion and just call it, this is my day of, of repentance, where I, I, I just stayed where I was, I let the elements pass, and I just did business with you, God. And the next time this is offered, I'm gonna celebrate how you warmed my heart, because I couldn't get it warm enough. It's okay to do that. It's okay to do that. But man, if you find yourself treasuring Jesus, wanting to figure out how to drink more of that water, not doing it perfectly, but keeping your eye, like keeping that pursuit going, needing this spiritual nourishment. That's, that's where I am. And I would invite you to come to, we've got two tables up here, one in the back. There's gonna be a song for you to reflect on. 
And then when we all get the elements, we'll take them back to our seats and we'll, and we'll take it together. I'll come back up and lead us through that. We'll have a solid response. Father, help us in this moment. Meet us. Make yourself real. We need you. And we expect you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You're welcome to come. Spirit is here. He's among us. And they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and the children also rejoiced and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. On that night, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he said, take and eat this do in remembrance of me. the same night he took the cup and said, this is my blood that's poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus, fill us with your spirit. Nourish us. And may we now respond with a song and a noise and a sound that is heard far away. Amen. Amen. Let's sing one more time. Our prayer partners will be up front if you have needs or concerns. We'd love to invite you to that.